to keep um, Hello, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Adam Saul. I'm the coordinator of the Creativity and Society program here at Vic. I'm the host of you. Um, I'm welcoming you to today's reading. Uh, I'd also like to welcome those of you who are on the live stream. Um, I want to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. Um, on this beautiful day in particular, we are sort of increasingly conscious of our lives on this land. Um, for thousands of years, it has been on the, the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga to the credit. Today, it's a meeting place uh, to many Indigenous peoples from across the Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, study, and learn on this land. Um, tonight event, tonight's event continues our faculty reading series, uh, which is meant every semester we have one of these events to uh, demonstrate to our students and remind them, and sometimes ourselves, uh, that are the faculty who are, uh, are not just teachers, but also actively engaged in their own artistic practice. Um, so we have Claire and Raleigh. Claire is going to start, so I'm going to introduce Claire. Um, I, I've introduced both of them fairly recently. Like I did a blurb on when you interviewed Sarah Polly, and I did a little thing on you uh, when we did that reception in November. So I like stole from, but so you've heard this people from another rest of the people. Just so some little bit. Um, um, Claire Bagsell is so apologies to you. YouTube, but not to person. Um, is the Wendy M. Cecil Professor at uh, Victoria College, cross appointed with the Faculty of Information and the English Department. She's also the Queen of the Jewish and Stream, uh, a big one. And she teaches everything uh, from modernism to creative writing to chapbook making to, I don't know, don't, I don't know, donut hole sculpting, sculpting, donut hole. Here. Um, uh, for Claire, a book is a made thing. And so I was very excited when she told me last semester that she had a new work that she was ready to share with the community. Um, this took some, a little bit of coaxing. Um, um, her book of stories, Circus, came out 10 years ago. Uh, um, and while it's not like Claire hasn't been busy doing other things, uh, we're all looking forward to hearing the sort of mad, what sort of magic has been happening in her imagination. What marks the stories in circus for me is how the veneer of the polite and the normal can mask the wild, the witty, and the downright strange, which has no connection to Claire's personality at all, um, or her character, not at all. Uh, please welcome Claire back. Thanks, Adam. That was really nice. Um, thank you so much for being here, everybody. And thanks to uh, Rally for sharing with me. This is really nice. And I also just want to super quickly say thank you to Vic because I just feel really happy and supported here and glad to see so many students from Vic here. So thanks, everybody. Um, so yeah, Adam mentioned that this took a little coaxing. I, I don't know how many times I said no, but it, it was a lot of times. Um, so the reason I have been reluctant to read recently is just because it has been a minute since I published some creative work. And um, I was sort of laughing when Adam put the circus on the poster. I was like, well, I mean, 10 years is recent in some definitions of history, but not <laughs> probably most people's. But as I was thinking about it, I thought, you know, I might read just a very tiny section from Circus because it's a book that I wrote while I was a student at U of T and when I was sort of close to where you are in your life. So I'm just going to read like a tiny little snippet of this before I share some new things. Okay, so this is the title story of this collection and it's called Circus. Susan's grandfather was a bear in a traveling circus. Or rather, he wore a bear. Actually, she's never quite sure how to put this. He wore a bear suit made from the skin of a real dead bear and wrestled someone in a wrestler's suit made out of not very much cloth. In his moments of glory, he reared up on his hind legs, which were his only legs, and roared. One of the first animal rights protests in the city of Tunbridge Wells was held in 1910 on behalf of Susan's grandfather, the bear, who happened to be human. This fact was never discovered because the circus was bound to lose business either way. If the ringleader exposed the truth, he would surely lose audiences who took pleasure in watching grappling animals. And anyway, 
Who wanted to see a man fighting another man in a bear suit? <laughs> Plenty of people, apparently, <laughs> as long as they thought at least one of the men was a bear. If, on the other hand, the circus master kept the fact of Susan's grandfather's humanity concealed, the animal rights activists would continue as they were, pelting innocent tomatoes and cabbages at the big top and vandalizing the caravans. The solution was that Susan's grandfather was set free. That's a little snippet of the past. Um, so I'm going to read a little, well, this is, I guess, a long poem, and it's from a new collection of poems that I'm just finishing at the moment. And I think that some of you who have taken my classes will recognize some little elements of this. And I wrote it partly because um, one of the things that I like to do in creative writing classes is think of the wildest and weirdest prompts that I can possibly get students to agree to accomplishing. And so, and one of my students last year in my chapbooks class started teasing me about the prompts and how increasingly strange they were getting. And so I took her up on that uh, challenge and kind of made it into a poem. So this is called Color Studies, and it has a couple of epigraphs, which I'll read first. So the first one is, in visual perception, a color is almost never seen as it really is, as it physically is. This fact makes color the most relative medium in art. And that's Joseph Alpers, The Interaction of Color. And the second one is, reality is a sound. You have to tune into it, not just keep yelling. Anne Carson, Autobiography of Red. Smell the way the air changes because of purple and green. And that's Kwame Dawes, purple. And finally, suppose I were to begin by saying that I had fallen in love with a color. Maggie Nelson. First, list all the things that are that color. Take your time. Not all your time, though, or your whole life will just be a list. Take a break. Rinse your eyes with a new color or the insides of your eyelids. Go again. The plastic box where spare exacto blades live. Reflective vest for nighttime safety. Classic highlighter. On the right day, the sun. There must be more. There are always more. Draw the color as a shape. Draw the color as a mail carrier. Draw the color as a bird or a fish. Stop drawing. What does it feel like to live inside a box painted that color? For an hour, a day, a week, without end? What happens to your body in the box? After, not before, Google neon yellow things. Write your way out with the box of color. What happens when you open the lid and look out? Learn the pigments. Vermilion, viridian, cobalt, know where they come from in the earth and what it means to take them. Not just pretty words, though they're pretty, pretty words. Lapis lazuli, ochre, raw umber. The nomenclature of color is woefully inadequate. Pin color wheels to your wall, color charts, color samples. Throw a dart at one. Close your eyes and stick a pin in one. Paint chips from the hardware store are the last thing in this city that's still free. Linger over them. Take the one you like least and the one you like most. Don't mind the Italian grandfather who asks you what room you are painting those two colors. Is that for trim, he asks, gesturing at the coral. Paint an energetic bouquet of flowers with your least and most preferred colors and give it to someone you like only a little and say, I painted these for you. Live with the consequences. <laughs> All the ways to measure color are also the ways to measure experience, value, intensity, temperature. Maybe hue doesn't quite work. No one here is going through the motions. I don't sleep if you don't feel the indigo making shagori striations through your fingertips. It's ridiculous, but it's true. My children ask to paint their bedrooms in order to live inside their favorite colors. Yes, like the box. My daughter changes her mind, decides to live inside one of her drawings instead. Green carpet for grass, stylized rainbow, clouds, Honolulu blue. All the objects in your mind. 
all the objects in your house. Add list. This is not a lesson. Is this a lesson? The same color, but a sonnet. Now the box is a sonnet. What is your favorite color? What's a favorite? Swirl the colors together. Blue, red, green, yellow. They don't mix, but they dance with each other sometimes on a crisp, cold day. Around the edges, white. What does neon mean when it swirls in on itself? I break my own rules all the time. Use the artwork as a setting. Make the story inside the artwork. Open your house to the stars. Try liquid forms, air and water. Don't let the dust in. I didn't used to know what color, color was materially. Something about cones and eyes. Mental note, read more about eye cones. I'm standing at the sink, watching, washing jam jars and the dish soap smells fake floral in a way I can't stand. At home, we always use lemon or grapefruit or rosemary, something you'd eat or that belongs in the kitchen. This one has a sick sweetness that low-key hurts me inside my face. My fingers are tenderly nudging the watercolors off the insides of the jars. The paint mixes in the sink, pure and then impure color, a hope we once had of making something from the day. I asked the chatbot about color. <laughs> And it is pretty good on the subject, tells me about cultural context and different. Everything beautiful is differently beautiful to everyone. Universally subjective. Is all aesthetic judgment subjective, I ask? And it says unequivocally, yes, it's subjective. And as a chatbot, I have no judgment. <laughs> I already know this, it's obvious. Like maybe everything is obvious, why ask the chatbot? Everyone is talking about the chatbot and everyone is scared of the chatbot. And I felt I just had to try it to be in on the gossip, even though I wish I could just dive under the bubbles with all this paint and wash down the sink in a swirl of bluey purple instead. But anyway, I feel I have to know the chatbot. So I asked the chatbot about my name. It knows mostly wrong things about me. It tells me another totally different book that goes by my book's title. <laughs> Google knows more than you, I say. And it says, yes. <laughs> Someone comes into the communal kitchen where I'm still washing the jars and asks about the rain, and I say, I don't know about today, and they say, me neither. They leave, and the door shuts, and there are ten more jars. I keep washing, and the hot water's gone, and the washing, is washing jam jars a kind of poetry? Maybe I should ask the chatbot, but when I trot, dry my hands and get out my phone and try and ask the chatbot, it is at capacity. The chatbot is not available. I've only asked the chatbot one series of questions ever, but I already feel the pull of it, the conversational drag. Why is everyone asking me about the rain? Color spaces used to represent colors that numerically must specify their light. Lab color measurements, unless otherwise noted, assume that the measurement was recorded under a D65 light source, or daylight 65, which is roughly the color temperature of some light. The chatbot is explaining, sort of. But, says Joseph Albers, no color system by itself can develop one's sensitivity for color. The Munsell system describes a color in three dimensions, hue, value, and chroma. Chroma, as I understand, CF, read more about X, Y, and the formula of Z, maybe understand what is formula, is the degree of difference of a color from gray. What degree of difference is this morning from gray? The Oswald system is scientific too, measuring colors by percentiles of white, but how is that different? I have loved writing the letters I've been writing to you. And what I love most is when you reply in embroidery thread. The letters have all the colors I know, but not in order, not in a sequence we can name. The letters are 20 years old and one day old. The letters dip their toes in a glacial lake. When there isn't enough room for the letters, it is lonelier here. And maybe that's when I start talking to the chat. Each exercise is explained and illustrated, not to give a specific answer, but to suggest a way of study. If form comes not from the outside, but from the inside, what does it look like? 
Pigment color differs from structural color in that pigment color is the same for all viewing angles, whereas structural color is the result of selective reflection or iridescence, usually because of multi-layer structures. For example, butterfly wings. For example, bubbles. For example, dragonflies. For example, decades, years, hours. When a pure metal is burned and viewed through a spectroscope, each element gives off a unique spectra, a sort of colored fingerprint. This method called spectral analysis led to the discovery of new elements and marked the first steps toward a quantum theory. Wait, is this a lesson? At last, a sequence. One, a person walks onto a plane, sees another person wearing the color and reacts. Same thing, but it's the distant past. Same thing, but it's a lyric poem and everyone is very angry. <laughs> Same thing, but the plane has broken down on the runway and it's raining. This one is a play. Same thing, but you're the person. Same thing, but you're the other person. New thing. Thank you, Claire, for the new thing. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And the student endorse were much appreciated. Riley Hodge is uh, our Shaftesbury writer in residence this year. He's the author of four novels and one collection of short stories. He's won or been shortlisted for a whole whack of awards, including the Giller, the Rogers Trust Fiction Prize, the International Dublin Literary Award, and the Hugo Clennon Prize for Fiction. He's been recognized by the Writers Trust of Canada with the Engel Finley Award, which honors a whole body of work. And he has been writer in residence in a number of prestigious institutions from Berlin to Vancouver. What is it about his writing that attracts so much praise and attention, you might ask? I mean, I don't know. I, my opinion of it is that his prose has an energy to it that's hard to articulate. You, are, you read a paragraph describing a man smoking a cigarette, and you wonder why your heart is racing and why you taste nicotine on your tongue. The pace is fast, but rich with detail, and the ironies of a complicated, sometimes violent world are material for humor, insight, and surprise. His new book, Stray Dogs, shows him at the top of his game with the same richness of detail, but with perhaps a more reflective mode than we saw in some of the earlier books. Is he mellowing with age? Not sure. Not sure. The world of these stories is just as broken and confused as it's always been. But maybe there's a different tonal register that he has access to. Either way, I'm continuing to enjoy his storytelling and continuing to learn from his passage. Please welcome, Brian. Thank you. Um, I heard this before, but I don't want to. It seems a little. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it, this residence has been um, wonderful. With a little interruption, my mother passed away. And, but, um, nevertheless, it's one of those passages of life, I guess. Um, uh, I'd like to thank my students, actually. They're, they're great. They're uh, intelligent, uh, eloquent. Uh, sometimes I think they're more intelligent than me. And uh, well, most importantly, very well behaved. Uh, I'm taking the liberty to, uh, since the course I'm teaching is about you know, intersection between visual and the written words, so I'm taking the liberty of showing some of my own photographs. Um, no direct relation really to the to the um, to the text I'm reading, uh, to the short story or the excerpt of the short story, but I thought I indulged myself. Okay, um, 
these are images that I've taken through the years with pinhole camera. I'm, I'm, I know that generation is very uh, familiar with that kind of analog, actually, thanks to the hipsters that um, Kodak decided not um, to, to resume producing um, film. Um, so I'm that, you know. Um, and okay, now. Um, yes, that is right. Um, so this is an excerpt of the short story. Um, most of the stories, if not all, um, refer to photography or images or light or it, 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 um, the visual, basically. Uh, I think this story, this this short story, is a bit too long. Interesting, but I'll, I, I think I'll, I'll stop. Um, I timed myself, and I think okay, that's about 15 minutes or maybe less. Maybe it's less. Um, can talk about this later if you these are pinholes, so when we project them, they're not and they're not centered at all. So, anyway, um. In 2011, I was offered a writing residency in Berlin. I was given an apartment in Kursberg. I worked on a novel in the morning and smoked outside on the balcony in the afternoon. Wherever I lean on the edge of the balcony, I would see below a street, a lamp, and a garden. One day when I was out there, a woman standing in the garden waved at me. A moment later, her, hus her husband joined in. I waved back and nodded. During the day, I spent a great deal of time alone writing and reading. In the evening, it became more my custom to join the couple in the garden for a beer or two. Lucas, who was a Nestle photographer, Hannah had a clerical job. We talked about lives, politics, books. We exchanged anecdotes and political opinions. Photography was Lucas' profession, but he also had a long history of involvement with, with syndicates. And in his use, as being a member of a German anarchist group. One night, Hannah confined that Lucas had lost hope in the world. He had lost his belief in humanity. He talked about his causes, Hannah told me. But their defeat was being too much to bear. The radical in him has diminished and his freedom into himself. A garden is every warrior's final objective, I said. And I wish to go back to photography, I said. He was happier back then. Well, I quit. Every hero is a being without talent. I was quoting the Roman, Romanian French philosopher Chiron. But as soon as I realized my insult, I excused myself and rushed back to my apartment. Not alone, at a party at Hannah's and Luke's home, a man who looked like Marx, long beard, round face, broad shoulders, and belly, approached me and asked me what I was writing about. He pulled a handkerchief from his back pocket and patted it on his forehead, then on his cheek, and finally inflated it loudly with his nostrils. I said, joking, I'm writing about the German soul. He chuckled, tucked his feet of cloth in the front pocket this time, and asked me to explain. I said, Germans have a distant and cautious approach to strangers which I prefer to the overly familiar approach to others in French colonial history. So, presuming the strangeness of other is right in your opinion, he asked. It allows for curiosity and the possibility of a future dialogue. So long as we're curious, he replied, we tend to tolerate. Indeed, I said, familiarity breeds content you quote the French novel Stendhal. You studied French literature. I nodded and volunteered at my work 
dealt with how photographic images appear in literature. The man nodded too and took a sip from his beer. You know, he said, he paused before continuing, this is the type of group. So it's not curious about you, I must admit. I was not interested. If anything, I have some hostility towards your type. I'm opposed to the money that our government squandered some foreign artists like you on getting them to come and live here and spend time on their inconsequential bourgeois projects. This money should go to social programs. You certainly fit the type they go for. Let me guess. They're French, educated, wealthy, and yet here is our government sprinkling cash on developing world privileged sort like you. I feel that the money spent on them could easily be put to better use. Because of you and the likes of you, our neighborhoods now are gentrified and our Berlin is changing. You're either naive or you're complicit with the neoliberal capitalism masquerading as a cultural contribution to the world. I said, I think you're partially right about who I am, I conceded. But what does our host, Lucas, think? The same, he said. We all think the same here about the time. I felt like leaving at the moment, but Hannah, who was watching from across the room, came over and led me by the hand into the kitchen. Let's have a photo of the three of us, she said, and she pulled Lucas over. You looked upset, and I wanted to save you, she said in a low voice. Santa over there can be offensive. Don't listen to me. Soon after, I left quickly. Next day, after my afternoon nap and feeling satisfied with the progress of my writing, I went down to the garden for my customary beer with Hannah and Lucas. I sat down and handed Lucas a bottle. We didn't talk about the night before. Over time, I had learned that the strength of a close-knit social group lies in its ability to compartmentalize. Lucas asked me what I was up to. I leave tomorrow for, Be for Beirut for a conference on photography, I said. You should come and visit my city sometime. He nodded and replied, I will. The conference was to be held at the American University of Beirut. I didn't expect many people to attend the lecture, as my subject was not directly related to anything overtly political, the Arab world, the Palestinian foes, or any such stressful objects. Instead, my presentation would be on the final passage in James Joe's short story, The Dead. And I knew that exploring the topic of the spatial in the world of James Joyce would be seen as an indulgence a luxury. In the last scene of the story, the protagonist, Gabriel, gazes at the window and describes his memories in a gradual visual moment, evoking a series of photographs that simultaneously detail the spatial and the psychological. We see the window, a lamp, the river Channon, and at the center of the montage, the very old site of the young Michael's fury. Gabriel's wife once upon a time lover. In reviewing this passage, I would emphasize the personal, local, and national context of the objects and places we observe, expanding on the mention of the river in this text, and in choice work generally and simultaneously, exploring the idea of a photograph as a subject suspended between life and death. I would certainly allude to Bart aphorism in Camera and see that, that every photograph is an image of what has passed. I would even dare to say that photography functions as a prophecy of death, overtly linking these observations to the title of Joe's story, The Dead. The more I thought about presenting present, the presentation of my paper, the more I felt that I was ultimately describing a particular suspended existence, my own. And I felt the temp 
the temptation to introduce another metaphor, my own identity as a person perpetually suspended between cultures, religions, and photography, and geography. But a part of me also hated the narcissism, that narcissism and opportunism that prevalent, that so prevalent in academia, no offenses. <laughs> After reflecting on this for a while, I concluded that while my work was indeed about ephemerality, it was not about the ephemerality of the self, but rather it examined the ephemerality of the image of the self. Every hybrid was a partial death, an incomplete acquisition of the original. The day after the party at Lucas and Hannah's, the day before I left for the conference, I, I strongly felt my state of suspension. All I could think about were the characters to the dead, the woman who had lost her first lover for the incomplete acquisition of another and the inevitability that should be lose them both. Thank you. I think we have a little time for Q and A. If you're if you're open to it, uh, if uh, anyone has questions, um, I can point at people if you have your hand raised, or you can just shout out. I have a question for you, and uh, I think it's called the dancer. Uh, short story. Uh, the dancer. The dancer. Yeah. And I noticed that it seemed different from the other ones in that it was centered around four. All right. Well, you were trying to Michael. Oh, I thought you were trying to double it. Watch the story of that. Why did you think one? Why did you think four? Four. Um, actually, um, this is based on the time where I was a photographer. Mm -hmm. I was a commercial photographer, so I did the last ways. I was a assistant for the wedding photographer. I've, I've done all kinds of jobs. Um, and, uh, I, uh, I worked for a studio, and because the studio was overbooked, so we hired me to Um, I was one of the assistant, but also occasionally I was photographed uh, uh, when um, uh, I must say a bitch can kill you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I had a colleague at the studio who was also a photographer from Poland. Uh, he was very exuberant, very talented, uh, but uh, he would dance on tables, get drunk, take the most amazing photographs. Uh, uh, and it's very animated, and people love him. I mean, he made him be happier, you know, with Jeff Davis. Uh, but it was tragic because he lived through communism, and he didn't, he didn't know. How to live in capitalist society. It's just, I mean, a bit of a tragic figure as well. Uh, that's kind of based on him, but not really. Does he know that he's a I haven't seen him in a long time. I haven't told you because we lost contact with him. Uh, but the last time I saw him, um, we didn't get along. I, I don't know. He <laughs> has very strange conspiracy political views, and um, we didn't get along. So it was very offensive. Um, oh, oh, oh. No, that's okay. So yeah. that that's that, uh, and everything. And other, you know, that yeah. I Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Question for both of you. Those pages work really nicely together. I'm struck by like this this visual sensitivity that you both have, right? Mm -hmm. So we saw the images. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about the images and 
we've got these static images and we've got this action happening there, right? So how we bounce. And for clear, like color doesn't like what can you do with color, right? Because it's so flat, yeah. static, and you're trying to like animate that into a pole. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to know how the pole looked as a kind of visual object. And then how do you actually bring light into something that is fairly neutral? Like if someone told me that, I would say like that's a non-starter, that's a dead end, right? <laughs> but you didn't yeah. feel that way. Yeah, I mean I think like I think the dead endness of it is sort of what interests me conceptually because I think um I think when Joseph Albers writes about color, like who's this kind of black mountain Bauhaus guy, he's really emphasizing that it it isn't the same either for each individual or also in relation to other colors. Like every time you put a color into a relation with another color, it changes. The visual experience of the color changes in relation to other things. And I was thinking about actually in relation to teaching sort of across visual art and, and literature about how words also do that. And the way you use figures and kind of put them up against one another shows you the words in different in different ways, right? All about this kind of contextual relation. And so even though the thing itself may be flat and even though like maybe there's also whatever, a word that doesn't seem to work, as soon as you like hit it up against other things, there's something new that starts to happen. And so that energy is like kind of, it's an interesting energy, right? But I think there's also something in that poem, I guess, about trying to understand like what color is and what we can do with it and what's possible because it, it seems very, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's sort of like an abstracted idea that we all think we understand. And in fact, actually understanding it scientifically was quite difficult, right? That there's different sort of, there is a complexity to the science of color that um, if you're not a physicist, it's quite challenging to understand. So, yeah. 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 That's in parts like set apart in the poem, or? Yeah. That, mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 And photographs, really? Oh, the photograph? Oh, these two are pinhole photographs. Kind of like the first pinhole that is there's no lens, which is a little pinhole. It's not a camera. It's just the chamber. It's more opening. And the image pulled through and put in the back of the camera. So, and that's how I guess you so so uh, uh but what I did is uh, these each image uh of system when you expose it is so there are shades as you see there are shades of light density of light and since I'm doing many exposures so it is about time actually each exposure is taken at different time. And if each density is also determined by time. So if you have two rooms right it's so time, right? That's least that's how I see it. But mostly they're poetic images. So I shifted down and played about it. Was that Berlin? Like what where no that's it, it this is where oh, it is but uh, some of the good good science on you know. Um yeah. Um, I don't remember all looking at the choice. We can project him to project something. Um, sorry. It might take a moment. So, if something yeah. wants to take another look. I'm wondering when you go. What is the question? What do you work to allow? For both of us. For both of us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm working on two things right now. Um, I'm, I'm trying to finish a collection of poems and then um, I'm working on some fiction also. Um, the, I mean, I was going to read like. A short story, I guess, more in like the sensibility that that Adam was describing that is my kind of fiction style, which is different than my poetic style. 
But then I realized that it was like loosely based on an event that I went to at you know, she was calling. So I was like, I this, this is fiction, but I feel like this is maybe gonna offend people. So I didn't read that one. Um, but yeah, so I'm working on a bunch of I wanted to write the first, uh, my intention was to write some, uh, the, the, the memoir. Uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't get into an altercation. I didn't have the courage. So um, I'm almost done. Uh, yeah. Now it's the division and the, the doubt starts. Now the doubt um, yeah, takes over. So that's what I mean. You work it up yet? I'm working managing that with your dad. Yes, uh, I don't know the first. Uh, first um, he said, yeah, for a while. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I was going to address um, my question to Charlie. Um, but I, was, I was just wondering, based on how you described, you know, your conception of photography, um, and this might come from a very personal place for me, but if there's a bit of, in a sense, an existential despair in the act of engaging in making that art, because, you know, I mean, I was struck recently by this notion that as opposed to actually memorializing, you know, these things that matter to me, that were of meaning to me, that had value to me, I was entombing them. You were what? Entombing them, like burying them, right? Like taking something that was ecstatic out of life, something in motion and making it static or hypostatic, maybe, because it comes back and somebody needs it. But, you know, I'm wondering how much. Perhaps a similar sort of notion might inform your art or the way you see your art. Um, because I'm very curious about what you were saying in, in terms of the liminal spaces that suspend, you know, uh, photographs, for instance, between life and death, and your role perhaps being the executioner or the conjurer, the necromancer. I guess goes both ways. Um, I, my, my relation with photography is really one of sadness. It is, uh, I mean, every time it has, it has given a certain sadness. It's very emotional, more than conceptually. Um, I try to justify conception, but for me, I think that's interesting. It's very, uh, and, and nostalgic, and I try to. I think it gets to the emotional substrate that I explained. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, it seems like a lot of them are concerned with death, even if they're not directly, but maybe that's just my interpretation. Well, yeah, there's a dramatic effect that I, that I like in photograph, and that's why I think I need to fall with it. To the new academic uh, uh, appropriation of what I would call the arts, again, much more perceptual and still in that, uh, in that end of traditional photography. Because personally, I like it. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't leap into the academic uh, or the academic. Uh, the genre that, that was, um, I still value craft to a certain extent. I think art means that the quality. You can you can actually present it very uh, non non well executed in my opinion. Photograph, but as long as you just reflect it, it's not text. 
I feel, I feel, yeah, I feel it's a bit of a, I might sound a bit like I'm getting some lecture, but I feel it's a certain hegemony for the academia on arts. Um, it's still the appropriation of the, uh, what is still valued, I'd say, the power to the will for certain in Japan. Um, I think in North America, you can't be far, but it's still what we have. Uh, with, uh, uh, yeah, it's total change. So with that sort of thing, I just take photographs for myself. I don't feel like the mom to that. You do it. So for me, it's very personal. And I rarely show the photographs. I don't sit there to show them in the either in the study on the camera, or I probably have the camera in the lens. But, uh, but that photograph is in the uh, that's the whole that I hope it's kind of famous uh, theater that was destroyed during the war. And right after the war ended, um, my cousin was working there as a security guard, and I sort of managed to go over there, but then it was. It was still a film of mines, but he moved away. And that's not a film, that's straight from the public. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I do kind of see that as part of the people of the people about that. I think I should be this book again because the process of this thing. Sorry. Yes, I need so much. Um, I was just wondering, as authors who have like published collections, um, like collections of stories, collections of poetry, how cohesive do you think the themes need to be to justify like putting certain works together in its collection and, and sending that to a publisher and saying this is one cohesive thing? Like how how thematically Related, do they have to be, or do they not really have to be at all? They don't have to be. Not to be at all. I, I don't know if there are things. No, they don't have to be. Um, I mean, I think, I think in, I think in my case they were sort of, but in the way that like the different acts in a circus, and this was my answer to that question at the time. Um, the the different acts in a circus are doing very different things. The acrobat doesn't have the same skills as the juggler. It's not the same vibe or performance really, but they're all under the big top. So there's like right. kind of like a sensibility or an experience that you expect that is part of all of them. So that's sort of how I thought of these stories, just in that way that like. And in some ways, it like it did help me actually to think about that. Just right, that you're like mm -hmm. trying different exercises, and especially as a new writer, like yeah. maybe you're trying on different kinds of acts or things, mm -hmm. and 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 it's okay for them to be heterogeneous. That's totally fine. Like that's I think that's the pleasure of short stories mm -hmm. in some ways is that they allow you that flexibility of voice. Um, yeah. I found that uh, both of you were saying this really beautiful like, meandering quality to it that like, sort of like bounces around and it can be, it's like, it's impossible to get it right because both of you are an job with it. And I wonder like, how do you find the balance of sort of keeping a, a pace and a tone, but also letting, letting the work wander to its own? I feel lucky you get that slow. There's an element of surrender, you have to surrender to that. Oh, that's a They found also as gifts of passages. I guess some writers have it more than others, maybe, and but also yeah, there's there's an element of concentration. 
I mean, I think also, like, I like a digression, you know, in reading, like, I'm into it. So I think like, I am a Tristram Shandy gal, you know? I, I like that kind of thing. I don't, I like it when a story is kind of like, I'm into it. Not everybody's into it, but I like that's very, very true. It's a, it's a style. And I think I like to follow roads wherever they go. And I think it puts a certain pressure on what Brown's describing as the flow. I might say the rhythm. There's a, there has to be some other, there's something that keeps you with us, hopefully, um, as you're as we're wandering. But I think it's just something I like in what I read too. Mm -hmm. And it feels like authentic too, like it feels like you feel the bit. Yeah, I like the I like the fun of this kind of walking through a story. I like that. Very many themes sometimes you think of genius. So, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> both both do this happen. Sorry. Okay. Um, I have a question up there. Um, so we brought chat to continue to your story. Sure did. <laughs> and I think sometimes when I write something, I like brought in like Instagram or. The internet, I think, oh my gosh, this is a blog here. I'm bringing that into the literary world. What am I doing? But it's, it is a part of our lives now. And it doesn't have to catch up. But we had thousands and thousands of years of writing that doesn't involve any of that. So, mm -hmm. how would you find this dream writing so fast? So, um, I've also publicly mocked people who write about ChatGPT. So, I, I, I like, you know, it was a bit. But I, I, um, I think so. It, there's a couple of things you know, about this question, I think. One is that, um, you know, Virginia Woolf writes about the omnibus and the motor car, and those are like new angle developments in her moment, right? It's like those are kind of new things. And I think, so I think it feels, you know, and actually I was, I was at a reading a while ago, and someone was talking about how there were deliberately people, a lot of people are deliberately setting novels in like the 90s so that they don't have to feel the internet. Like there's there's this kind of like thing where if you don't want to do it, you gotta go, you gotta backtrack a little on time because um and it's you know it's just it's what we're doing now, it's the, the way that we're living. And I think that um where it's most interesting for me in fiction and in general is where we're humans in relation to the thing. So whatever the character, like whatever what is the character in relation to ChatGPT, ChatGPT up as a topic is like not interesting in fiction, but how you become a different person by interacting with it or how you how it makes you feel, I guess, is like that seems to me the stuff of fiction in a way that like just the thing itself, the development of ChatGPT is not the stuff of fiction or poetry. You know what I mean? Like I think. I think it changes us, and so being attuned to the ways that we're we're with it, it's helpful. I I I also had a writing teacher once in high school who was like, you should never refer to the intro. Like, you know, it was very like this will make this will date your work. It will make it seem old fashioned. So I was like, okay, well that was a rule, so I'm gonna break. You know, like I I have a very contrary nature about things like that. So when someone tells me not to do something, I immediately have to. <laughs> yeah. So the question too. Um, sure. So why have shy away from making it a lot? And mm. um, knowing more about color helps people appreciate it more. Why should I make it away from it? So I love that question, Z, because I think that I, one of the things I'm working on academically at the moment is a history of the creative writing prompts and looking like way back to antiquity and kind of forward about these kinds of exercises that people try and use to evoke writing in their students and to try and kind of make that happen. And 
I came to that partly because I, if you've been in my classes, this will not surprise you. I don't like telling people what to do, actually. I kind of hate telling people what to do, and I don't really care if they do what I tell them that they're supposed to do. It's a problem, but it's a problem. Like, I don't, the, the language of the assignment is always in the imperative voice. So that's also something that I came with in the poem is like, I'm telling you to do a thing. In this case, no one's going to do it, but I think that there's something about the lesson as an assignment or as a kind of directive or as like a thing that that is impelling a person to do something i have a real discomfort with that just and and it's something that i'm really interested in as a dynamic where it's just this you go through these motions where i tell you to do something and then you do that thing and then you want to know like all the minute details of how I want it, and like I don't even want it. You know? so, I think, so I think that that dynamic has been honestly like endlessly humanly passing to me in a way I can't totally express in the classroom. So I think that's where sometimes it's coming out in my work. This kind of feeling about like who am I to be in charge? Like this is a bad idea. But but also. What is it this about we tell each other to do things, or even as a parent, this comes up a lot too. Like, I don't, you know, I don't really want to tell you what to do. It's not, it's not a comfortable relation for me. So I think a lot of my my trepidation about the lesson comes from the imperative voice of the lesson and the kind of control that it implies of one human being over another, which I think is something I just don't really believe in. So that's really interesting to me because felt like the like, oh, is this a lesson? Like, that's where you are. Like, like, when you were being like, well, when you were listening to what this is this, and what you were doing, and it feels more like, um, I'm pretty confident and assume that everyone in this room has had this experience because you are affiliated with UT. When you are really excited about something, but it's weird. Yeah. You're telling someone about it, and then they say, like, oh, what a know it all. Um, but it doesn't really feel like the act of knowledge, it's just like the act of actually sharing, um, which yeah. does not necessarily have a hierarchy to it. Yeah. Um, so that's why I was surprised by the, only this is a lesson. I mean, like, those are my first time. So for me, I also really love color theory. Um, it feels like that's just like kicking off. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, th I mean, I think that's right though. I think there is like, like I, I think curiosity is so beautiful. Like that's the good part, right? Of the if the lesson is or the if the imperative assignment is like the uncomfortable part, the good part is like is curiosity and voraciousness and like the learning that we can do together. And if we can get to that place, however we get there, that's like why we're here, right? That's that feels great. And so I think I think it's just figuring out like how you yeah, how you manage that, how that how that translates to other people. And then I think there's also a certain amount of ironizing, right? Like, like I think those moments come in when I'm like, have I been banging on too much about color theory? You know, like it's that kind of self-consciousness as well. Like, is this, is this gonna be a two-hour lecture? Like, are you strapped in? But like, you know, so that, yeah, I think it's just a it's a questioning, right? I would I would mind if I could throw that back to you. Just for you, Ian will talk now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.